Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today in the second installment of the Take Action webinar series. I'm Bill Johnson, a weed scientist at Purdue University, and I'll be moderating the first part of the program today. And Dr. Mark Laux at Ohio State University will be moderating the second part of the uh, webinar today. This series is designed to bring you valuable information on weed and herbicide resistance management topics. It's a collaborative effort between the Take Action program and land-grant university weed scientists. Joining us this week, we have Dr. Aaron Hager. Good morning, Aaron. Good morning, one and all. And we have Dr. Travis Leglider. Hi, Travis. Good morning. And Dr. Mark Laux from Ohio State University, who will be moderating the second part of the program. Hello, Mark. Hi, good morning, everyone. Before we begin, I'll provide a little bit more, a little more information on the Take Action program. Farmers' freedom to operate is being threatened by the increase and in spread of pesticide resistance. The consequences include short and long-term economic challenges, decreasing land values, and the uncertainty, uncertain regulatory pathway to access crop protection tools crop losses and other challenges. Take Action is a farmer-focused education platform designed to help farmers and their advisors manage herbicide, fungicide, and insect resistance. The goal is to encourage the adoption of management practices that lessen the impact of resistant pests and preserve current and future crop protection technology. Take Action is brought to you by the Soybean Checkoff. For more information on Take Action, visit I will take action.com. Just a reminder that you are welcome to submit questions at any time by typing them into the question box on the right side of your screen. We will answer these questions following the second presentation. Our first presenter is Dr. Aaron Hager. Aaron is an associate professor of weed science in the Department of Crop Sciences at the University of Illinois. He attended Southern Illinois University, Carbondale, and received a BS in plant and soil science in 1991. He then went to Michigan State University and received his master's degree in weed science in 1993. Later that month, he joined the University of Illinois as a weed science extension specialist and worked on a PhD at the same time. He completed his PhD in weed science and joined the crop science department as a faculty member in 2002. As an associate professor of weed science at the University of Illinois, Dr. Hager is responsible for weed biology and management research in corn and soybean systems. His research focuses on examining the biology and management of weed species that are common in Illinois agronomic crops. So Aaron, we're gonna turn the floor over to you and Aaron is gonna talk about effective long-term management of water hemp. All right, well, thank you, Bill, for the introduction. It's a pleasure to be here today. And certainly would like to uh, thank the USB and the Take Action for organizing uh, this webinar series. And so the title of the presentation that I've given this morning, it says Water Hemp Effective Long-Term Management. And it's been an interesting pathway watching the evolution of water hemp here in the state of Illinois over the last 25 to 30 years. And in all the work that we've done with this particular species, it, it really has uh, I guess hit home with me that if you really want to think about effective long-term management, there's really, I believe, no other way to do this than to begin with an understanding of the species biology. And I think, so what we're going to do here in this particular uh, uh, webinar is actually highlight some of the very important biological characteristics of water hemp because they really are the focus or the reason why we, we see some of the challenges with effective long-term management of the species. Now, you're looking at a distribution map that actually was published back in 1957 by Dr. Sauer, looking at the distribution of the various amaranthus species across the United States. And it's a little difficult to read, but if you look fairly closely across the central part of the Midwest and the Corn Belt, there's actually two species of water hemp that appear on Dr. Sauer's map. And for many, many years, actually, it was very common to actually refer to tall water hemp and common water hemp. But of course, there has been a lot of challenges with understanding the taxonomy 
especially in these particular species of, of amaranthus. And I came across this quote that you now see on the screen, and I thought this was a fairly interesting quote. Uh, and basically, I, I just read it to you. It says, many of the species approach dangerously near to one another. And the complex question of adaptation and modification of invented forms together with the still greater uncertainty which prevails in regard to hybridization among certain groups of species has rendered the question of specific limitation one of peculiar difficulty and uncertainty. And the reason I share this quote with you is that it's, it's really not anything that has been printed or quoted recently. As a matter of fact, this actually was a quote that was given, I think, back in 1894. And Bill, I think I may have a problem here. There we go. We've got, we've got control back. So clearly, well over 100 years ago, taxonomists were struggling with the identity of the various species here of amaranthus, in particular with the water hemp. But now if we fast forward to our current time, there was work that was published from Iowa State University several years ago that essentially concluded what we're dealing with now, instead of trying to separate two species of water hemp, we have a very diverse uh, poly, uh, species that we generally now just typically call tall water hemp. And the slide right now, what you're looking at, this is a copy of a water hemp management guide that we actually produced clear back in 1997 when we started looking at water hemp in the state of Illinois. Now, the irony of this is that water hemp is actually indigenous to the state of Illinois. It's always been here. But up until about 30, if you would have asked to, you know, every farmer in the state of Illinois 30 years ago about water hemp, none of them would actually have recognized it as a separate species of amaranthus. One of the challenges, of course, with identification of the amaranthus species is that those that grow in the state of Illinois, every one, when they're small plants, they all have a red root. And so many people just assume because it looked like a pigweed and had a red root that it had to be red root or, or at the time referred to as rough pigweed. But actually, water hemp is indigenous. It's actually more commonly found historically in areas of Illinois south of approximately either Interstate 70 or Interstate 64. And the reason I show you this, this particular slide right here is not necessarily to highlight the guy, but really it's really to highlight the photograph that you see over here on the right-hand side of the screen. And this was a photograph that Dr. Lloyd Wax took at the Brownstown Research Center clear back in 1968. And every one of the amaranthus plants that you see in that photograph actually were water hemp. But now if you fast forward now to where we are today, beginning about 25 years ago, we began to see this rapid expansion of water hemp farther north in the state from its area of historic distribution. And now with 102 counties in the state of Illinois, it's relatively easy to find water hemp growing in every one of those counties. And so I guess with that brief introduction of the species, I'd like to now move into more of the biology of water hemp and try again to highlight some of these biological characteristics that are very important to understanding how to long-term effectively control the species. And, and first and foremost is the germination and emergence characteristics of water hemp. And we would typically describe this as a very continuous germination and emergence characteristic. We don't necessarily see just discrete emergence cohorts in the early part of the season. We typically can see water hemp germinating anywhere from about April here in Illinois up until actually through about August or September if conditions are right. And so if you think about a species that has this very prolonged germination and emergence characteristic, it's not difficult to understand that many of the soil applied herbicides that we use in either corn or soybean simply do not have sufficient persistence to give season-long control of water hemp. And then conversely, on the post-emergence side, we rarely would apply a post uh, emergence herbicide to a uniformly sized population of water hemp. And this is particularly highlighted in areas or in fields where no residual herbicide had been applied previously. And we certainly can see additional emergence of water hemp following any type of a post applied uh, herbicide that does not have soil residual activity. And in this slide, hopefully, you can see the fact of a very large distribution of sizes here of water hemp. And this would be very typical of a field that had not had a residual herbicide applied close to plant. And you can see probably the largest water hemp in this particular slide is somewhere between a four to six leaf stage. 
whereas others are just emerging from the soil at a cotyledonary stage. So again, distribution of size is something that can be very, very challenging for adequate coverage and control from a post-only type of a program. And these are simply data that look at the emergence of waterhead over a four-year period at Urbana. And it really wasn't going to highlight the, the peaks and the valleys here in this particular graph, but rather the dates along the x-axis of this slide. And you can see here we're looking at emergence beginning sometime about mid-April, but yet we see emergence continuing up until about the early part of July. Now, if we maybe go back and look at uh, weather records, we may be able to actually graph precipitation and see some of these peaks on the emergence that followed a few days after a precipitation event. And this is simply published work out of, university, or, uh, out of Iowa State University where they see a very similar pattern to water hit emergence in that it's very, very prolonged. And even some of their data from, from Iowa suggests that water hemp is even emerging even later in the season uh, for this particular data set, as you can see here. Now, also from Dr. Hartzler's lab at Iowa State University, this is looking at the survival of water hemp as affected by emergence state relative to soybean planting. And obviously, if you have water hemp that emerges fairly close to soybean planting, the mortality across the remainder of the season with no her other herbicide or management implemented tends to be fairly high. But once, if you can delay the emergence of water hemp by somewhere around 40 days after planting time, then any plants that survive after that only have about a 50-50 chance of surviving to the end of the year. And out here at 50 days, that frequency probably drops to less than 10%. And this is also work now done from uh, uh, looking at water hemp in corn as a factor of when it emerged relative to growth stage of corn. Now they measured biomass seed production mortality in this particular graph or this particular table, and you can see that across all the metrics that were measured, water hemp plants that emerged at the same time as corn produced the highest biomass seed production and had zero mortality toward the end of the year. And it really wasn't until about the V6 stage of corn that we get, begin to see a very significant reduction in terms of biomass and survivability. So anything that is emerging close to either corn or soybean emergence without additional and adequate management very likely is going to produce significant biomass and seed production by the end of the year. And one thing that was very interesting to learn, this is actually work that was done by Dr. Larry Steckel while he was here at the University of Illinois working on his PhD is that water hemp plants tend to be very shade tolerant and they actually can produce an abundant amount of seed even under when growing under shaded conditions. Now water hemp is perhaps not as shade tolerant as something like nightshade but it certainly is more tolerant to shade than many of our other summer annual species and without a doubt seed production can be influenced by date of planting or plant emergence as well as what sort of a competitive environment these female plants find themselves. And even late emerging plants are capable of producing seed. And so one of the data tables from Dr. Steckel's paper looked at biomass mortality and seed production of water hemp based on establishment in either May or June and then under different levels of shade. Now there's a lot of numbers to look at on this particular table, but I'd just simply like to draw your attention. If you go down into this table under 68% shade level, you can see actually that mortality of water hemp growing under 68% shade was zero across both years of this particular experiment. And I think what these data help describe is, is what we have seen repeatedly down through the years. It's very, very common to see soybean field across very large portions of Illinois that look like they are uh, free of any water hemp plants until about the third week of July. And then all of a sudden we start seeing individual plants start poking through that closed soybean canopy. And I believe what these data suggest that if we have water hemp plants that actually had emerged before that soybean canopy had closed, because of the shade tolerance of this species, they're able to continue to grow and eventually work their way above that soybean canopy. Now many years ago when we first started looking at water hemp, we obviously had a lot of questions. And one question of course was, what type of soybean soil applied herbicides or corn for that matter are effective for managing water hemp? And then the other question of course that we had that was really related to the germination and emergence characteristic 
when should these herbicides be applied? Should we try to apply these closer to planting time or could we make an application several weeks in advance of planting time and still maintain adequate control throughout the growing season? Now, but you're looking at a table of a publication that Dr. Worley talked about last week that illustrates some of the activity levels of various soil applied soybean herbicides against water hemp in the state of Wisconsin. And I simply put this up here to demonstrate that there's many either active ingredients or pre-mixed products that can demonstrate very good activity against water hemp. But with the question of the application timing, when should these products actually be applied? This was work we did many, many years ago, looking at the influence of application timing on water hemp control. And our two application timings were either early pre-plant, which turned out to be five weeks before planting time, or applications made the same day that we planted the soybean crop. And so when we looked at the various evaluations over time, when we looked at the four week after the early pre-plant application timing, across all the herbicides that we had, we averaged about 71% control of water hemp. Now conversely, if we look at four weeks after soybean planting, so four weeks after the pre-emergence, we see somewhere between 18 and 20% better control of water hemp by simply delaying the applications much, much closer to planting time. Now, conversely, on a post-emergence program, one question that we really didn't know when we began working with this species is, when should these post-applied products be applied in order to prevent any loss of yield potential in soybean? And these are, this is our data that we generated from a study that we conducted here over a three-year period in 30-inch row soybean, at a water hemp density that literally was so thick that you could not see the soil between the rows of soybean. And over a three year period, what we learned is that somewhere between this two and four week interval after emergence, that's when water hemp began to reduce the soybean yield. And I think at worst, we had about a 42 or 43% uh, yield reduction in soybean if we looked at season long control of water hemp. Now here's water hemp interference in corn looking at relative emergence of water hemp compared with, with corn growth stage. And really, I don't want to get into the details of, of the, the actual yield losses, but to illustrate the difference between the years of this experiment. And you can see the bottom line here in the year 2000, when rainfall was fairly adequate, the amount of yield loss was fairly low and certainly much less than in the years 2001 and 2002 when rainfall was fairly limited. And so we can see, you know, upwards of a 55 to 60 percent yield loss in corn with water hemp that emerged very, very close to the emergence timing of corn under rain limited conditions. Now, some of the first recommendations that we developed for control of glyphosate resistant water hemp was clear back in the year 2008. And one of the final recommendations that we developed was to remove any surviving plants, rope the field of surviving plants before seed was produced on the females. And at the time, it sounded like a really good thing to recommend, but quite honestly, we really did not know how long the interval between pollination and viable seed actually was. And so this is simply looking at a progression of seed maturation following pollination. And you can see as early as three days after pollination, these seeds remain sort of a creamy yellow color. And by somewhere about 12 to 13 days, they really take on this very, very black, shiny seed coat. And what we learned from the work that came out of Dr. Trannell's lab is that somewhere between about 10 or approximately 10 to 11 days after pollination is when these seeds actually do become viable. And so what is the relevance of, of bringing this up in this particular webinar? Well, we have seen instances where there have been chopping crews that have been brought in, especially in seed corn production fields, to try to remove water hemp plants or at least cut them or hoe them out before seed harvest. The problem of it is in many times they just simply cut the plants and leave them on the soil surface. And unfortunately that really does not do very much to reduce the actual seed load in the field because most of those seeds on the female plants have already reached a viable state. And so one other thing to think about if we had a few surviving plants closer to harvest time, if we simply walk in front of the combine and pull these plants up and leave them on the ground, we really have not done a lot to reduce the seed load. Now, conversely, if we elect to do nothing, what you're actually looking at in this photograph is one of the best weed seed spreading implements that man ever created. And if you doubt the fact that weed seed is not moved through something like a combine, 
I'd share with you this photograph that I took many years ago. This was in the spring after harvest of this particular soybean field east of Urbana, and you notice these peculiar looking green rows. And if you look very, very closely at what was actually growing in those green rows, this was all water hemp that had made its way through that combine in the preceding fall harvest. And so we're not going to talk a lot about herbicide resistance in this portion of the webinar series because there's some very good presentations that will be coming up in the next couple of weeks related specifically to resistance. But what I'd like to end on is the fact that, of course, there are biological characteristics of water hemp that really help facilitate the evolution of herbicide resistance. And one we really haven't touched on yet is that water hemp is a dioecious species. And what that means is that any water hemp plant that you find in the field is either male or female. The males produce the pollen, the females produce the seed. Well, the females can produce obviously a very large quantity of seed as we've mentioned previously. But if you think about the amount of seed that a female can produce, if she makes a million seed, then that means she has a million different flowers. And at least theoretically, she may be able to be pollinated by one million different males under field conditions. And so think about that in terms of the genetic diversity of the species like water hemp. And there's very easy ways to see this genetic diversity under field conditions. One, of course, would be to look and simply see the different colors of water hemp plants that grow in any particular patch. You may have some that are very, very deep green. You may have others that are completely red and still others that may be variegated, both green and red. And of course, the other way that this genetic, or genetic diversity has been expressed is through the evolution of resistance to various herbicides. And right now, I believe we stand at, this is a species that now has evolved resistance to herbicides from seven different site of action classes. And so very, very challenging because historically, when one particular product or group of products no longer effectively controlled water hemp due to the evolution of resistance, one of the things that many people did was switch, simply switch to a different product or switch to a different herbicide class. But unfortunately, water hemp is very, very adept because of its vast genetic diversity at evolving mechanisms of resistance to many of the herbicides that we have used for a long time. And this simply is a slide that I've put, actually put together and used now for about the last 10 years. And I really, for 10 years, never really changed the wording on this slide. You'll see it here in yellow, it says, how do you manage a wheat population for which there may not be any effective viable post options for its control? And as I just indicated, I really hadn't changed the wording of that text for somewhere eight or 10 years until this year. And this year I added the text you see toward the bottom of the slide in blue, and it says, and reduced residual control from many soil applied herbicides. So this is really the conundrum that we do face with the species and its ability to try to actually evolve resistance to many of the herbicides that we historically have been very successful in using for its control. And so I guess to wrap everything up right here, the recommendations for effective long-term management, this actually is the exact recommendation that we came out with in that 1997 guide that we saw toward the beginning of the slide presentation. And it says simply that water hemp is a species that generally cannot be adequately managed by a single approach. We may be able to manage it with a different herbicide for a period of time, but as we've learned repeatedly now, at least seven different times, this is a species that is very likely to evolve resistance to any particular herbicide strategy that we throw at it. And certainly I believe it does highlight the fact that for long-term management, we're going to continue to use herbicides to manage water hemp species, of course, but it really highlights the need for additional practices and additional practices that ensure that there is no weed seed return at the end of the growing season. And why is that so important? Well, it's highlighted here in an abstract from, again, some of Dr. Steckel's work here. And this is an abstract of an experiment that began in, here at the University of Illinois in 1996. In the fall of 1996, there was an area on our farm that was so overrun with water hemp that you literally could not see the corn plants in that field. And at the end of the year, all that water hemp seed went directly into that soil seed bank. So 1996 was the so-called train wreck year. It was the worst possible amount of seed production that could have actually happened. And I won't bore you with the details of the experiment, but what I really want to highlight is that 1996 was the last year during the duration of this experiment that any water hemp was allowed to produce seed. 
And for the next four years of this experiment, the authors went back in and resampled that soil seed bank to determine what fraction of that original seed bank remained. And really, here's the key part of managing water hemp. By roughly four years after a train wreck disaster in a field, the amount of seed remaining in that seed bank was only 0.004%. And this is the weakness of water hemp. This is the weakness of a water hemp population that's evolved resistance to five or six or seven different herbicides. The fact is that the weakness of water hemp is the seed. And the weakness lies in the fact that the seed does not remain viable in the soil seed bank indefinitely. It's not something like a velvet leaf that's going to remain viable for 30, 40, 50 years. You're talking about here probably on average anywhere from four to seven years, and much of that seed viability is lost. So take that collectively to try to ensure that no seed is produced in any particular field for perhaps three years or four years in a row. And what you'll notice simply is that these numbers, the population level, the density of the water hemp really begins to plummet in these fields. And I think that's really the long-term effective management strategy of water hemp. It's not necessarily that we're going to move completely away from herbicides or tillage or cover crops, but really that we need to make sure that by the end of the growing season, that we're not augmenting that soil seed bank with additional seed. And with that, Bill or Mark, that was the last slide that I had. So I think I'll stop right here. Okay, thanks, Aaron. I uh, We don't have any questions coming in. I, I have one. Um, so obviously a component that we're starting to talk about here for water hemp is, is uh, you know, seed management. Um, you know, if your herbicide program is less than effective because it just is or you have herbicide resistance. And I mean, we have some new tools for late season um, sort of seed management or uh, harvest seed management, right? Yeah, and, and again, um, I, I think that these could be components of a more integrated system. So instead of just allowing those few escape plants toward the end of the year that many think, well, you know, they're, they're really not hurting anything. They're really not competitive with the crop. And you, you probably can't argue that. But on the reverse side of that, if you think about that differently, those surviving females now have gone through one additional year of selection for whatever the control tactic that we had used that season. And so anything like a harvest weed seed control that can further reduce the amount of seed return into the soil seed bank, I think, again, as a, it's not going to be a standalone solution to this, but certainly could be something that adds a lot of benefit to overall long-term management in the long run. Right. Um, I think we'll, I think we'll, uh, we may have some other questions that come in. Um, I I'm, think we're going to go ahead and move to uh, Travis's talk. So our next talk is by Dr. Travis Leglider at the University of Kentucky. He's an assistant extension professor of weed science in the plant and soil sciences department there. His research and extension program are based out of the University of Kentucky Research and Education Center in Princeton, Kentucky. Travis's program uh, at UK focuses on the management of weeds in corn, soybean, and wheat with an emphasis on control of herbicide resistant weeds and evaluation of herbicide application technologies for efficient delivery of product target plants. Travis obtained his PhD from Purdue University and his master's and bachelor's degrees in plant sciences at the University of Missouri. So I am turning it over to you, Travis. Okay, thank you, Dr. Lux. Uh, again, uh, my name is Travis Legletter, and what I want to talk to you guys today about is uh, herbicide deposition and coverage, and uh, just talking a little bit about the balancing act that uh, farmers and applicators really have to handle when they're making herbicide applications. So uh, we'll kind of get into it here, if I can. Okay, so when, when we think about our herbicide applications, uh, there's a lot of steps to making a good herbicide applications. Uh, first, identifying the correct pest, thinking about uh, which herbicide and choosing the correct herbicide for that pest and applying it in a timely manner. And uh, this is a lot of stuff, uh, a lot of the take action publications that have come out really cover pretty in depth is the, the correct identification, which herbicide to use and when to use it. But the last step is making sure that we deliver that herbicide appropriately. And that's what I wanna talk about today because that, that's a big hurdle within itself. So when we, when we make that herbicide delivery, there's a lot of destinations that droplet can have. So uh, ideally, all of those droplets make it to their target, 
but the reality is some of them are going to go off target. Uh, I think most of us are aware of uh, the ramifications of that, and we're not going to get too much into drift today or any off target stuff, but uh, if we're going off target, we're not finding what we want in our target we can evaporate those droplets or they can become suspended in air and in both those situations again those are situations where that droplet's not getting to the target we want and once we are on that target again there's still a large challenge to get that droplet into the plant and so on but today what we're going to talk about is just thinking about effectively getting to that target so when we talk about deposition and coverage we really have to think about what are we spraying and what are we trying to get to? So today we're gonna to just talk about herbicides. That's what we're focused on here is herbicides. Uh, we're not gonna talk anything about fungicides or insecticides and those are kind of a totally different story when it comes to deposition and coverage. But herbicides, you have to think about, am I spraying a systemic herbicide or am I spraying a contact type herbicide? Uh, because it's a, that's a big factor to think about when we're thinking about, do we need coverage? Do we need deposition? Do we need both? And then what are we trying to hit? Or what is our target? So the soil is a pretty easy target. And really, if we're talking about a residual herbicide, as long as we get it there, the activating rainfall that we all we hope to get will distribute that in the soil as needed. Uh, grasses are a little bit harder to hit just with that narrow leaf blade, uh, but certainly we can accomplish it. Broad leaves are gonna be a little bit easier to hit, but there's a lot of surface, a lot of differences in surfaces that can uh, wreak havoc on that and leaf orientation you know velvet leaf is the popular one uh, dropping those leaves in the evening so uh, not a great time of day to be spraying a particular herbicide like that or a particular weed like that and then lastly just getting into that crop canopy if there is a canopy and thinking about what's the crop canopy as well as our weed density which we will get into so the first thing I, I really want to kind of cover here is deposition versus coverage. So when I talk about this, a lot of times when we talk about our herbicide applications, we talk about coverage. So you guys can see the cards there, uh, the three cards here, uh, and hopefully you can see my pointer there. So a, a card here that would be represented by a, a nozzle, the TTI, TT11005 nozzle that's probably producing a medium sized droplet, medium to coarse sized droplet, versus a card that was sprayed with a ULD nozzle that produced an extremely coarse droplet spectrum, and then the TTI, which is producing an ultra coarse droplet spectrum. And as you look at these, and you've probably seen cards like this many times before, it's pretty obvious that we get better coverage with this nozzle that produced a smaller droplet spectrum. Than this nozzle that produced a larger droplet spectrum. And I don't think any of us are going to argue about that. You can even see it in the numbers down there at the bottom. Uh, different coverages are occurring between these different nozzle types that produce different droplet sizes. But the other thing that we need to think about is we need to think about how much are we actually depositing or what's the volume that we're putting on this card. And that's something that's not answered by the spray cards. Uh, these are simply a 2D image. So that gives us a good indication of coverage, which would be a, a quality factor, but it doesn't really indicate to us the quantity or the amount. So, you know, for example, with this droplet right there, we don't know the depth of that or the volume of that. And as we get into this, what I'm gonna talk about is the reality is the amount we're depositing or the quantity or volume is the same between this nozzle here and this nozzle here, despite differences in coverage. And again, this is where it goes back to thinking about what am I spraying? If I'm spraying something like Liberty or Gramoxone or Flexstar, a contact product, we need to think about coverage and we need to be on this in the spectrum, okay? But if we're spraying something that's systemic like glyphosate, uh, 240, dicamba, we can be on this in the spectrum where maybe we're not getting the coverage, but we're still getting the product deposited where it needs to be deposited. And we'll talk about the attributes of having maybe some of these larger droplet sizes uh, such as drift control uh, that uh, I think will be covered quite a bit in future webinars. So it's just one thing I want to cover is just talking about what is the difference when I say coverage versus deposition, we're, we're talking about two different things there. Coverage is more like the quality, whereas your deposition is your quantity. So moving along here, thinking about what affects our deposition and our coverage, uh, I'll cover a couple of different topics here and just starting out with droplet size. So when we talk about droplet size, 
when we talk about our nozzles, we put them into categories, droplet size categories. And the important thing to remember here is that that nozzle is not producing just one size of droplet. It's a spectrum, and those categories are covering that spectrum. So we measure all the droplets within that spray cloud and microns, and then we use the cumulative volume measurements to classify that. So you guys may be familiar, I've seen numbers like the VMD or DV50, and usually you're also maybe might see a DV10 or a DV90. And it is important to understand what these numbers are telling us. So as we look at four different nozzles here, something like an XR nozzle or just a single stage flat fan nozzle might give us a fine droplet, whereas a Turbo T might give us a medium droplet, uh, the AIXR giving us a very coarse and the TTI giving us an ultra coarse. So we'll refer back to these, but again, just different nozzle types are gonna give us different nozzle spec or droplet spectrums. But again, uh, the important thing that I'm trying to get around to here is just this TT nozzle here or this AIXR nozzle, it produces a very coarse droplet spectrum. But remember, not all of our droplets are gonna be all the same size, it's just within that spectrum. So if we look at it, and what I'm showing you here is an example bell curve. So this is very pretty, it's very normal. Uh, this is not reality, but in order to demonstrate this, that I put up a normal curve here because it's easier to demonstrate. But the reality is when we look at that spray cloud or that spray fan or the cumulative volume, most of our droplets are gonna fall within the majority of the bell here. And our DV50 is gonna go right down the middle here. And that's telling us that 50% of our droplets are this size or smaller and gives us a pretty good ind indication of the, the majority of droplets are around this size. And it's a good indicator to give us an idea of how big or small the droplets are. But the other thing to think about is, and the other thing we, we should pay attention to is the DV10 and the DV90. And that's giving us some indications of where those tails are at on that curve. So at DV10, if you see that, that's saying 10% of your droplets are this size. So in this example, again, it's just an example, are 274 microns or smaller, whereas the DV90 is saying they're 594 microns or smaller, 90% of the droplets are. So looking at these, what this tells us is, Again, most of our curves aren't normal like this. It'll tell us if it's skewed to one side or the other. But again, the DV10 can be important because in this example, you can say, if you know that driftable fines are about 200 microns, you can know, okay, well, I'm not at 10% driftable fines, but it's probably just a little bit below there. So if that DV10 is somewhere up further towards 300 or 400 microns, you know you don't have a whole lot of driftable fines but then that DV50 and that DV90 are gonna be much higher as well. So the bottom line on this is all of our, when we spray with a nozzle, we have droplets all over the board, but just understanding what those different uh, values are giving us there. So when we think about that droplet size and those categories, and we covered this a little bit already, the smaller the droplet category, the better coverage we're gonna get. And, and again, this is focusing in on coverage. And so this was some work that was done at uh, Purdue while I was there. And again, an XR that's producing something around a, a fine to medium droplet versus a TTI that's producing that ultra coarse droplet uh, spectrum. Again, you're still gonna have some small droplets in here, but overall you're losing coverage with this TTI versus the XR. And again, when you're talking something like a contact, that's important because we want to be on this spectrum of coverage and not here. We're not going to get a contact product to work for us when we're getting this amount of coverage. But what does that mean for deposition? So again, remember deposition does not always equate to coverage. So deposition is how much are we getting to the plant? And one method we use to find this is after an app, we put in a fluorescent dye into our tank and after the application, we'll go out and harvest the actual plants out of the field and wash them and look for the amount of fluorescent dye that we deposited onto that plant. And then we'll compare it to the size of the plant and that can give us a, a value in microliters per centimeter squared. So this is a study that we did here at uh, UK uh, by a master's student conducted here. And this is actually on goosegrass. So we went after goosegrass because it is problematic for us here in Kentucky. And again, just thinking about grasses are a little bit harder to hit. And what she found was, is that uh, despite the fact that we know we're losing coverage with this TTI, we're getting equivalent coverage with these three nozzles where this TT nozzle is giving us uh, a smaller dropper spectrum versus this TTI, which gives us a very large dropper spectrum 
but we know we're losing coverage, but our the amount we're depositing on that plant is staying the same. And that that's the bottom line here on something like a glyphosate plus dicamba. If we can keep that uh, deposition, that's gonna help us out. So here's another study that she conducted, and this was on water hemp. Uh, and again, it's the same thing, two trials, despite having different droplet spectrums, we're keeping them the same amount of deposition, even though we know we're losing coverage, okay? So as we move on here, and if you're concerned about coverage, I argue that it's not droplet size we need to be worried about, it's actually spray volume. So I think spray volume, it plays, while we know that droplet spot size plays a big part in coverage, our spray volume plays even a bigger part. And again, this is a study done at Purdue looking at those spray cards and 140 liters per hectare would be 15 gallons per acre and this would be 10 gallons per acre. And you could see every time we were getting better coverage with the higher spray volume than the lower spray volume. So if you're worried about coverage, we would encourage you to increase your spray volume and then play around with your droplet size rather than just dropping your, your droplet size right off the bat. Okay, so moving into weed density, uh, this is a question that I had as I came here to Kentucky was, how does weed density influence this all? We, all? we had a pretty good idea that it had an effect on it. So we wanted to look at it a little bit more in depth. So this is the same water hemp study. And what we did is uh, we manipulated the amount of water hemp plants that were in a quarter meter squared, that's about three square foot. Um, so we had four to six plants at our lowest density up to 54 plants in our highest density. So if you think about that slide that Dr. Hager showed of that uh, with no pre, that's what this plot would have looked like. A lot of plants in a three square foot area and they are all different sizes. We targeted two to four inches. So we, we sprayed when the majority of the plants were about four inches or a maximum of four inches is when we sprayed that. So this is the deposition uh, work again. So again, you can see we're depositing the same amount of product despite having differences in density. Now, I'll, I'll say that there's a little bit of a fallacy here in our sampling method because, because of manpower and time, we're only able to sample three to four plants uh, per plot. And so if you think about that, we're not getting every plant, uh, but it's the best representation, representation we get. So when we come down and start looking at control 21 days after application, that's where we start to see it break apart. And that high density plot, we're losing control. And the reason we figure we're losing that control is because we're just not getting enough deposition or coverage on all of those plants. And again, if you think about that picture that Dr. Hager showed, there's a lot of little plants hiding out and below there that are hard to get to. And then again, in the second trial, again, uh, we did have an interaction there and it's with that TTI nozzle, that ultra force nozzle, that's where we lost the coverage at the high density. But again, if you look here at the lowest density, we can spray with any of those nozzles and get the control we need. So if we're gonna wrap this back around to some things that Dr. Hager talked about uh, or Dr. Worley talked about, we have to have pre-emerge herbicides and that helps us out quite a bit when we go to make that post application using some of these large droplet nozzles. So the last thing I'll talk about here is off target movement. Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. This is the only slide I'm really going to talk about. But if we're not getting onto our, if we're going off target, we're obviously losing coverage and deposition where we want to be. So you can control that with your droplet size. So, as we all know, the bigger the droplet, uh, the faster it falls, the less likely it is to drift. And the other thing is thinking about height of release. So, keeping our booms as low as we can. It helps us tremendously and is a factor a lot of us overlook, but we have to keep those booms at that 18 to 24 inches to help us control some of that drift. And then also thinking about those things that are out, outside of our control, wind speed, temperature, humidity, temperature inversions, and really it's a matter of just working around these. So when it comes down to thinking about deposition and coverage, we have to balance a lot of things. And, and for an advocate or a farmer, it's a lot to balance uh, and it's hard to find a perfect balance on this, but balancing that droplet size to where you get the coverage you need, but also getting deposition and mitigating drift potential. So if we think about drift, we want big droplets, but if you think about coverage, you want small droplets. So you have to find a happy medium there, but also think about the additional factors that play in there, such as spray volume, 
can help you out with that coverage while keeping that droplet size up. Thinking about that weed density, using a full approach, using some pre's to help you out with that, uh, and our boom height and our environmental conditions to help us out with drift control. So again, maybe we don't have to go all the way to that that massive droplet that that loses coverage. So uh, again, that's it's a lot covered in about 15 minutes there, but uh, just thinking about all the things we have to control when we're making that spray application and finding that happy medium. Thank you, Travis. Uh, I got a, I have a question for you. I, you know, we're getting into a lot of um, situations now, and I would sort of target glufosinate here, where we can mix glufosinate with, you know, the 2,4-D choline products, mm -hmm. and you know, it's going out with glyphosate, and I don't think glyphosate and glufosinate necessarily play well together all of the time. You just have a lot of things like contacts and systemics. I think we're starting to do, which is, which is a good thing. I think. Um, in terms of having that many sites of action, it's still working things. But I, I think, is it is it introducing some new issues on nozzle selection and volume and things like that? Yes, it is introducing a, a lot of issues. So as he indicated, just spraying a contact and systemic together can cause us some issues in itself. But as far as nozzle selection, yeah, because with that Liberty, we're really wanting more of a, a medium-sized droplet. But then again, we're we're wanting to think about drift control as well especially if you're putting a growth regulator in there so yeah it's balancing that and it does cause us a lot of issues in thinking about that but again if you're really wanting to chase that coverage with that liberty or the glufosinate product uh, upping our spray volume uh, only helps us on that to an extent i mean obviously you still lose coverage with those ultra coarse droplets but uh, again that's where i think spray volume can help us but it does introduce some new challenges and I guess I'll say is we've thought about it and we've we've looked at it a little bit, but there's still a lot of questions to be answered there. Right, and I think one of the things because people still remember the low volume technology with glyphosate, which sort of went out yes. the window. But you yes. know, I know we do get the question. Um, you know, I know the systemics are optimized in lower volume, but the contacts higher volume. So it's just kind of I think it's interesting that people remember that. And my yeah. my, my usual comment is, you know. The higher volume your systemics will work right and and you really yeah. don't have a choice if you're trying to optimize the contact right 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 with the contact you have to have that coverage right so that, that's that's where you need to go to towards and um especially if you're targeting a lot of glyphosate resistant species i mean that's that's what you're wanting to optimize right and i think another question is you mentioned time of day and we did a little work on this so that, and i think it's an interesting Topic. So, what what do you recommend for optimal time of day for post fully applied across a range of herbicides? I, uh, you know, the optimal time of day is uh, we really think about it at, at the middle of the day if you can get your wind conditions to work with you. So that's kind of the, you know, if we can hit it uh, about midday, that's really optimal for a lot of these products. But again, the the challenge is is if the wind cooperates with you or not, because a lot of times that's when the wind is at its peak. Right. I think the work that we did was reduced at six in the morning and then reduced and sometimes at six in the evening, but in a lot of cases by nine. And then so, you know, you sort of try to pencil out like a thing like, <clears throat> excuse me, OK, you know, don't be out there right at first light, you know, wait till 730 or eight and try to shut. You get to the point where you can stop then finish off a load late afternoon, then do that. But yeah. I mean, it's easy, it's easy to say that given yes. wind conditions. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, wind conditions kind of they're they're the other thing you have to balance in there. But right, Aaron, if you're still on, um, got a question on uh, long-term management. Um, is so in terms of rotations, and we get the question about we still actually plant some weed in this state, probably not enough. But uh, what's your what's your effective rotations and your, your recommendation there on on uh, management of water hemp? Rotations can be effective, but it really depends on what specific type of rotation that we're talking about. And certainly having a winter wheat crop in the rotation could potentially eliminate some of the early season emergence of watering that we, that we do see. Now, conversely, once the wheat crop is taken off the field, we still could have, again, because of the extended duration of emergence of watering, we still could have additional flushes that would come up. If you're in a double crop soybean system, obviously those warrant attention. But if you do not have any additional crop intentions after the winter wheat is taken off, 
Uh, again, the recommendation would be to not allow that field, any emerged water in that field to produce seed by the end of the year. Could be another herbicide application or it could just simply be mowing off the field uh, once the plants are a little bit larger before we see the viable seed being set on the females. So if you plant double crop beans, is that another round of selection for resistance going on? It certainly can be if we apply another herbicide. See, selection for the evolution of resistance occurs virtually every time that we make a herbicide application. So we have to keep that in mind, certainly. Right. Okay. I think we, uh, I don't see any other questions, so I think we're going to stop there. I want to thank uh, Travis and Aaron for the presentations today. Um, a recording of this uh, will be available on the Take Action website at IWillTakeAction.com slash management. And just a reminder, you can always go there uh, a day or two before the webinar to uh, that same website right on the front page of I Will Take Action. There's a link to register. Um, join us next Thursday for another webinar with Dr. Pat Tranel from the University of Illinois talking about metas metabolism base and multiple resistance. Um, and Dr. Amit Jala from the University of Nebraska talking about uh, pollen mediated gene flow and transfer of herbicide resistance in amaranth species. Uh, thanks for all attending, and we will uh, hopefully see you next week. <laughs>